thank you for that introduction, Mark. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, all right, great. Uh, so before I begin, uh, I just wanted to describe a little bit about my approach to the uh, lecture tonight. Um, I thought rather than give just uh, my sort of public talk, I thought probably a lot of you are engineers or scientists yourselves and probably have some background and have thought about this pretty deeply. So what I'm gonna present today is something closer to what is my typical seminar that I give uh, to physics and astronomy departments around the country on this topic. That said, I don't want anybody to fall behind or get frustrated, so please don't hesitate to uh, ask questions and raise your hand if uh, I'm completely confounding you on something, but I hope that this will be at about the right level. So uh, the title here today is uh, Simulate Exoplanet Habitability. Uh, my goal is primarily to uh, teach you what the cutting edge of how we're thinking about these uh, exciting new exoplanets that are being discovered uh, operate and what the likelihoods are that we might actually be able to determine if they can support life. So, assuming this, is, oh, how about I turn this on? Let's see. I saw that change from when I was up here before, sorry about that. It's still working. But now, no. Oh. All right, well, I guess I'm going to do this the old way. Pushing the buttons on here. All right. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about, I thought I'd start with telling you a little bit about how I kind of got into this business. Um, this scene right here is a, a typical one of my childhood. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and when I uh, would you know, go out at night, you know, this is what I would see. I know it's a little different from what we're used to up here. But uh, in the summertime especially, I liked to uh, sit in my backyard and I would stare at the, the stars. Um, of course, it wasn't hot as hell anymore, and so I could enjoy the outside. And uh, while sitting out there, you know, probably like a lot of you, I would lose myself to the thoughts of what was going on in the night sky. And uh, I started to kind of have some of those questions that I think a lot of us think about. And uh, when I was a kid, I sort of would maybe formulate it like this, like, why is the Earth the only known planet that has life? That seems really strange to me. Um, and then I also, of course, wondered, you know, could we find life amongst the stars? Uh, and so, sitting there at night, I often would wander this, and when I would kind of get done with that, I would often go in, and um, it was the early 90s, I, my parents had a PC computer, and I taught myself to program basic uh, programs, and so I would uh, kind of alternate between just hanging out outside and trying to stay up all night and trying to code games. Uh, and so, uh, when I, as I've grown up and become a, a professor finally, um, I've managed to merge these two uh, sort of passions I had as a, as a child. Um, and also now as I'm a professor, I've realized there's better ways to formulate uh, these questions. Uh, I always like to tell my students that good science questions start with the word how. Uh, so perhaps the better way to formulate these ideas is how did life begin on Earth and how do we find life beyond? So these are the two motivating questions for my research. And they're also the two foundational questions for this new field of science we call astrobiology. Uh, and at first glance, these two uh, questions might not seem very related. Um, but the hope is, is that by making progress answering one of those questions, we help answer the other one. So for example, should we figure out what the Earth was like when life originated on our planet? That might help us figure out where we want to look amongst the stars to find a uh, habitable environment. And similarly, should we find life on an exoplanet, that might help us understand how we got onto this rock. So, as we think about these questions, you know, that's sort of the overarching theme here today, uh, but we, we only have one place to start uh, as we embark on this journey, and that's of course the only habitable planet we know of. And that's this one. And here we run into one of the primary obstacles in our research uh, is that Extrapolating from a, data, a sample size of one is really difficult. Uh, and so we're, all, we're already kind of at a disadvantage here, trying to understand where we're looking for life and how we find habitable environments in the universe. But our planet is pretty interesting, and maybe more interesting than some of you realize, we find life in rather interesting places. For example, the, uh, the Grand Prismatic Pool in Yellowstone National Park, where those eponymous colors that you're seeing there are not due to soil or minerals, those are different forms of life that are living at different temperatures and different levels of acidity, and they are presenting, them, they're presenting themselves in these amazing colors. They're all little microorganisms, but they're all thriving in this environment that would kill us. 
We also see life at the bottom of the sea near hydrothermal vent fields where there's no trace of the sun. These organisms that are down here have no, uh, no idea that there is life, uh, if there's a sun up above, but yet these the organisms thrive off of the geochemical and geothermal uh, products of our planet. We also find life in sea ice. Uh, not completely obvious from this movie I've just put on right now, but um, some colleagues of mine in the oceanography department in Seattle, they have gone to the Arctic, they have scooped up ice from the ice sheets, and they have brought it back to their lab in Seattle, and when they let the ice melt, they take videos like these of all these little bugs that are um, thriving in the water. It turns out that they live in little one millimeter wide brine tunnels uh, in the sea ice. They're perfectly happy there, but uh, of course, another environment that would be really challenging for us to live in. Uh, finally, we also find life in the driest deserts on our planet, like the Atacama Desert in Chile, where they measure rainfall in units of millimeters per century. And here, the life lives 10 centimeters or more below the surface, and it just lives in a dormant phase, uh, waiting for the downpour that comes once a century, at which point they're, they sense the water on their cell membranes, they activate their metabolism, they reproduce, it's a big micro party for a hour, hours, days, and then they return to hibernation and wait 100 more years. So we see an incredible diversity of life on our planet that is thriving in environments that all of us would consider extreme. And indeed, the uh, recognition of this diversity of life on our planet is one of the primary underpinnings of this new field of science, astrobiology. And it gives up somebody like me, who works in this field, some confidence that maybe if we actually do point our telescopes to some of these exoplanets, we're gonna find life. We don't need to find Portland, Oregon on the planet. <laughs> we can find a planet like <laughs> Grand Prismatic Pool, or an ice-covered planet, or uh, a water world, an ocean world, or a desert world. All of these planets might be able to support life. So despite this diversity of, of life on our planet, uh, there are some commonalities. Um, in particular, there are three uh, features of all life on our planet that are consistent. Every single organism on our planet requires energy to grow, thrive, and survive, and reproduce, etc. They also all require uh, a, a set of elements that we call the bioessential elements. Uh, if you remember your periodic table, these are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. I've put iron at the in parentheses because there has been a claim that there is, in fact, one organism that does not require iron, but it's controversial. Probably iron is a bioessential element, meaning every single organism needs that for, uh, for life. Finally, there is liquid water. Uh, that is the medium by which biochemistry can take place. It uh, facilitates the movement of large molecules and the assemblage of larger molecules like DNA and proteins and things like that. So as we look up into the night sky, um, and astronomers search the heavens, uh, we see that energy is very common, therefore stars, like what's uh, in the background of this image right now. Uh, those elements that I've listed up there are all some of the most abundant in our Milky Way. Phosphorus is the least common at 13. So it's the 13th most abundant element in, the, in, our, in our galaxy. So plenty of energy, plenty of, of the bioessential elements. It's liquid water that is the, uh, the bottleneck. That's the, uh, that's the ingredient for life that seems to be difficult to uh, maintain in environments in our universe. Water itself, the water molecule, is very abundant, probably the third most abundant molecule in our galaxy, but it's liquid phase. That's the tricky part. So uh, that leads to a concept that many of you have heard of, uh, the habitable zone, uh, something we call it the Goldilocks zone. This is uh, a figure from 25 years ago, uh, which is sort of basically still our classic picture of this. Uh, and this uh, image that you're looking at here, uh, the, the vertical axis there is the mass of the star in units of our sun, and the, the x-axis is the distance from the star in astronomical units. That gold strip right there, that is where uh, the starlight is potentially able to sustain liquid water on the surface. And in, in particular, what atmospheric scientists have realized is that there are these nonlinear positive feedbacks that uh, the water molecule possesses that limit its um, viability on the surface of a planet. Um, and really, the way I like to think about planets is they're basically cooling machines. <laughs> they're basically absorbing a lot of sunlight and trying to shed it, 
right? They were basically, but planets are, they just reproduce, or process, excuse me, uh, starlight. It turns out that when uh, a planet is radiating at 300 watts per square meter, so a pretty good amount of energy, if you think about light bulbs and things like that, that turns out to be a situation in which water cannot be in the liquid form. It has to be in the vapor phase. So without liquid water, if all the water is steam, you don't have any chance at life. Uh, at the other end is what we call the maximum greenhouse. Uh, that is basically a situation in which it's just too cold, right? You just don't have enough energy in your planet's atmosphere or surface to maintain liquid water. It's just going to freeze. And crucially, these are these runaway processes. Once you get into one of these states, forever will it rule your destiny. You are stuck in one of these states, barring some truly uh, un unlikely event. The other line that's up here uh, is the tidal lock radius, excuse me. Yeah, I could, so you can see it right here. Sorry, I have to over here. Um, this is uh, a line that was drawn on this figure uh, that denotes where a planet would become a synchronous rotator, meaning that that is where one side would face the sun and one side would not. Um, this is what really drew me into this field. My original training is as an orbital dynamicist. I worked on uh, the formation of the solar system and on the dynamical stability of exoplanetary systems. And eventually that led me to thinking about tidal effects. Um, but one thing I would point out, compared to those, the, the boundaries of that gold strip, the uh, tidal lock radius is just a spin state. Um, so when you see that, don't, think, don't equate that with being a habitable planet. And I know that I bring this up just because there are a lot of uh, ideas that have been floated around for decades that this boundary of a tidally locked planet is where you can't have a habitable world anymore. And I just want to clear the air here that that is not true. In fact, it looks like more recent modeling has shown that if a, a tidally locked planet is more likely to be habitable uh, than uninhabitable. <laughs> so that's a pretty new, recent change, um, but I'm not really going to go into that today. I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, something that you're all aware of. So uh, I want to present this. Uh, start, I want to present this uh, example. Uh, this is a, a system called Trappist One. Just curious, who has heard of Trappist One in your audience? All right, a lot of you, probably the rest of you, have uh, think about cosmology more, but that's okay. Uh, so Trappist One is a really exciting system for somebody like me and for other people that study exoplanets. Uh, it's a system of seven planets. Uh, they all orbit a star that is a extremely small, uh, about 9% as massive as our sun. Uh, it's also relatively close by at only about 40 light years. All the planets transit their host star from as viewed from the Earth. That means that the, the, the planets cross in front of the disk of their star as viewed from Earth. That's really crucial because it allows us to learn more about these planets than we would otherwise. We, and there's even a hint that perhaps we could be able to see their atmospheres, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, these uh, concentric rings I've drawn around the, uh, the system here, uh, around the star, represent the habitable zone. The green is what we would call the optimistic habitable zone, or excuse me, the conservative habitable zone, where probably an Earth-like planet, if you plunked it down there in that green region, it would stay Earth-like. It would have liquid water oceans. Uh, the orange and green extensions are where if we maybe push things a little bit and crossed our fingers, maybe that planet might be habitable. And so what you see here is that there are at least three, maybe four planets that are habitable in the system, which is really mind-boggling to think about what a system like that might be like. Now the reason why we're excited about this system so much is because it is the best known target to search for biosignatures, which is our buzzword in astrobiology for an unambiguous sign of life. Something that just, you're convinced the only explanation can be that there is life on that planet. And the reason, and, and the telescope that we're going to use to hopefully scan this, these planets' atmospheres and search for life is known as the James Webb Space Telescope, probably something that most of you heard of. Uh, this is a six and a half meter mirror telescope that's being launched by NASA, uh, hopefully next year. And it is, has the chance to uh, measure the composition of the, of the atmospheres of these planets. Uh, so that's going to be really exciting. But it's really hard to, under, to overstate how difficult this challenge is. Uh, I love showing this uh, image as a demonstration of, of what I'm talking about. This is an image of a transiting planet, but this is the transit of Venus. 
uh, as viewed from Earth. This is an image from something like seven or eight years ago. Um, what you see here along the wisp, I hope you can see it on, you can see that, that little wisp of a ring, that is Venus's atmosphere um, compared to the sun, right? Uh, it is not a big signal we're talking about here. Um, it blocks something like 0.001% of the star's light, so that annulus, that ring around the planet is a very, very small signal, 10 parts per million. Um, but we can, if, but that is a signal. That is something that we can potentially observe. Uh, with the molecules block specific wavelengths of light, that is, of course, spectroscopy. So if, if we can use the JWST to measure those uh, molecules, we can start to understand what is happening inside that planet as well as what's going on on the surface. So that's what we're hoping for. But of course, I don't need to tell all of you and remind you that this is a challenge because it's so very far away. Even at 40 light years away, uh, we're still talking uh, tens of trillions of kilometers. And so it's a real challenge uh, to do this. Uh, and so JWST is hopefully going to launch next year. Uh, we were at dinner last night and I was uh, telling uh, uh, your colleagues that uh, there's a chance, there's a, something like only a 10 or 12% chance right now that it's going to launch on time. So we're probably going to be delayed again. I think that'll be something that we'll get we're pushing a decade and a half delays and launch, so hopefully it'll be worth it. <laughs> we'll see. But hopefully it'll launch next year, if not, probably the next year. And um, the way that this is going to happen, if we're assuming it does, is that we're going to, so astronomers are going to have to observe every single transit of a planet for at least five years. So that means uh, galactic astronomers and stellar astronomers are going to be staring at something and they're like, oh, nope, the transit's coming, point back, get that transit, now go back and do your, your, uh, what your other science was. And that's gonna have to happen every transit for five years. And if you remember those orbital periods on that video, they were on the order of a week or so. So you're gonna have to be really paying, paying close attention to, to that clock. And I also just thought I'd mention this number too. Um, when you work out the numbers for how much JWST costs to build and launch and maintain versus the duty cycle, that is to say how frequently we have to observe these planets, we're talking about a hundred million dollar experiment. So I hope you uh, are, uh, enjoyed spending your tax money on this. I'm grateful that all of you did. Um, as long as James F. Webb launches, <laughs> uh, there's no disasters at the launch pad. Um, hopefully, we are going to take these data, and hopefully, that will reveal life on one of these planets over in Trappist One. So it could be by the middle of this decade or the end of this decade, we will have our first data in hand that potentially allows us to discover life in the universe. So that's sort of the situation right now, and uh, I want to spend the rest of this uh, this time talking about the research that I do. Uh, and some of the results and kind of give you that update about what's going on at the cutting edge here in terms of how we are trying to make sense of how best to spend your money, your hundred million dollars, uh, to try and maximize the return on this uh, JW JWST investment. So what I primarily do is I try and investigate all of these ways and all